Crikey. And how many of you are in other, involved in other sports? And how many of you are swimmers and other sports? Right, okay, that's great. Right, so welcome to the Institute of Sport. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Adrian Morehouse, who is the person you've come to listen to. So uh, without further ado, over to you, Adrian. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm not sure what you're expecting, what you've been, what you've been told about who I am and why I'm here. Um, actually, I'll give, that, I'll give that a go, actually. Ask a question. I'll start with questions rather than time. So. Or what do you think you need to do to listen to it? Is it just a chance of missing school? Missing an hour of lesson? You know, do you know, well, you, I think some of you know I'm a swimmer, probably, given there's like a whole lot of bunch of swimmers being wheeled in walking. Um, so I, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. So I, so I'm probably older than your parents, I'm the first starter. Um, but I swam in three Olympic Games. So I competed for Great Britain um, in the 1984, 88 and 92 Games. So I was in three Olympics and I won a gold medal in 1988 in the 100 metres breaststroke. Um, during that time I broke the world record six times, so I held the world record for over seven years and I was world number one for six years. So even though I'm a 52 year old bloke, I used to be a swimmer and I used to be a kid that couldn't swim. So that's the interesting thing, is whatever, however far you get up the ladder, you start off not being able to do your thing. Right? So when I was three years old I couldn't swim. So I think there's something quite interesting about, and you probably talked a lot with the coaches and the and, and Paul and different people about the journey, your journey. You, know, you start somewhere not being able to do your sport, then you start to learn to do your sport, then you get better at it, then you do competitions, and then before you know it, you're in some programme like this that's suggesting that you might go different places, and then you become more aware of what you see on TV, more aware of the sort of the more well-known sports people, and then you've got people on the island that are well-known to you and people in the British team, people on the world stage, but they all start off not being able to do it. That's probably the most important thing to remember, is we all start not being able to do the thing we started. So we've all done and made the journey. And you're just at a, a stage that I've been through, that lots of people go through. Whatever age you are, whatever place you are in you know, your performances, you're at a place where every single sports person that's ever won anything goes through. You have to. It's called growing up. <laughs> Um, the other thing that's maybe of interest, if you have watched the Olympics um, in Rio, is that I was a commentator for the swimming. So I was over in Rio for two and a half weeks just recently. On the, not the Paralympics, I wasn't there for Paralympics, I was there for the able-bodied games. And I was commentating on the swimming, and I've done that for the last six Olympics. So I've competed in three, and I've been to six to commentate for the BBC. So you won't see me, because they usually show Andy, um, Mark Foster and Becky Adlington on the settee, because they're far better looking than me. And my fellow commentator, a chap called Andy Jameson, and he used to swim as well. So Andy and I are ex-swimmers, and we just talk. So we're the guys that just talk about the races. Um, and sometimes we try to make it interesting, sometimes it's, you know, we just get a bit funny, have a bit of a laugh, because it is quite good fun doing that sort of thing. Um, so really, um, I could talk to you about a lot of things. You're a huge man. By the way, I've got four kids as well myself. Um, my eldest two are in a swimming club, um, surprisingly. Um, the, my eldest is ten, and my second is nine, the girl and the boy. Um, and they've only done one race each, ever. One club championship race, that's all they've ever done, so in ten and nine. So they're, they're quite slow, and you know, sorry, not slow in swimming terms, but slow to get started. So I've not rushed them to do anything, and they, they love it, they enjoy it. But Tom, my nine-year-old, decided he wanted the summer off this year. So he said, Dad, I'm not going all summer. Is that all right? I said, yeah, it's fine. So that's kind of what's going on for me. So interesting to know. I'm interested to know. And I know this might be not the sort of thing you want to do is talk in front of people, but what you might be interested in, what sort of things, given you know that's my background, and I'm here, I'm here for maybe just before 9.30, is there anything that you really want me to talk about? So I can tell you about anything. Team GB, I've been connected to Team GB for the last six Olympics. I was an ambassador in London, so I was connected to the team, a team ambassador. So I know quite a bit about going through the different phases of sport, winning, watching the guys win now. So is anything is it of interest to you that you've been thinking about or talking about within the programmes? And have you got something to start with? Some more guys. There'll be some more. They're normally quite chatty. That's good. That's, good. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay, because I can say, you know, when you ask you talk, when somebody like me asks you a question from the front, sometimes oh, I, might, I might look 
It's silly if I ask a question. Perhaps, perhaps one of the things you perhaps speak on behalf of uh, people here. When you were growing up and you were working at school and working training, how did you yes. make that balance? So balancing school and training, yeah, interesting. That you're, you're obviously got, quite a lot of you got to go to school now. Um, so my I, same thing, same thing, same when I was trained. I trained from six to eight in the morning um, and got out, had my breakfast either in the but on my dad's car or on the bus, and then went to school and got there late often. Then because I, I, I trained a long way from school, um, so that was interesting actually because I had to stand in a late section in our school was a little area where all the late kids used to stand, and that was usually. Some, half sports people and half we just couldn't be bothered getting up. Or his parents got to school late. And so it's kind of interesting group to stand in. Um, I, I enjoyed school and I kind of worked hard at it, but I found it really difficult. I found it really hard um, because I was tired out. <laughs> so when I'd done four hours of training for swimming, so I'd done six late in the morning, went to school and then went 4.30 to 6.30 at night, um, and then had to do my homework. I used to fall asleep in my homework. So I, I tried to do it at lunch times, but then, you know, that's kind of a bit of social time when you might actually see other friends that aren't swimmers. And so I was tr that was difficult to try and see your friends that's not swimmers and just met, have a, hang out with them as well as do schoolwork. So I was behind all the time on schoolwork. All the time. I never caught up. Um, somehow I got lucky and passed my exams, my old levels, which are GCSEs now. So I did okay GCSE level. Um, I carried on to A-levels as, well, as well, actually, and stayed in school. It was a great, I was in a very fortunate position because school were really supportive of me. And they, some teachers weren't, though, even though the school was supportive. You know, headmaster said, it's great that you're a swimmer. And a couple of the teachers were. A couple of the teachers weren't. Um, the French teacher did not give us stuff that I was a good swimmer. And actually, he fell asleep in one of his classes once. And in, in those days, they had the, board, the chalk and the board rubbers. And he threw the board rubber at my head to wake me up. And it hit me on the head and I was a bruise for a week. Not the way teachers should behave. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. You said that you played rugby. Yes. Swimming. Earlier, okay. not not just yet. Just have to in the car park. We were Sorry. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Um, what age did you did you stop doing the rugby and did you start focusing just on the swimming? Well, I was at school, uh, an independent boys' school, so we did rugby, cricket, you know, athletic. We did swimming, um, but my two sports on a Wednesday afternoon were rugby and swimming. So it's about. I was trying to pull that off from the age of 13, 14, and I chose at the end of 14. And, I mean, the joke, the, yeah, the joke, I think the cap, the joke was that swimming, swimming's cleaner and you don't get hit. So that's why I chose swimming. But actually, I was probably pretty bad at rugby. I wasn't so good. So actually, I chose the sport I was most successful at. And interestingly, I chose, and this is, I don't know this is, where this is going to land, but I chose a sport I was in more control of. Because I just, when I didn't get picked, I thought it was a teacher. I thought he just didn't like me. So I thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be anybody else's control. I'm going to swim a race, win it, and get picked. I, they have to pick you if you win. So that's why I chose swimming, actually. Um, because I, I think the other thing is that, what, but, but, but I know this now about team sport, having been connected to team sport quite a bit, is you are still in control of your own performance, and it is down to you, all of you, to make it as good as it can be. Do you know what I mean? So, you know this as well, there are, there are no shortcuts, um, none. So what you, I think you need to work out is work out where you are and where you want to get to and then work out what those people are doing and are you prepared to do it. So, you know, if you know that um, Adam Peaty, to swim, use a swimming example, who's got the gold medal, is training at that level, and he's doing that kind of work, you've got to be prepared to do the same thing. Because that's kind of the benchmark, and benchmarking is quite a useful exercise to do. And often competitions are benchmarks because, you know, you get in a competition or, or a match or whatever you do, you're, you're, other people are not swimmers. Um, and that's your benchmark. You find out how good you are against the opposition. And that's what sport is. Ultimately, sport is you challenging yourself against other people. And you're either got a time, a score, you're judged, um, um, yeah, or get points, and then you win or you lose. I think the interesting thing about, I just want to, where I want to go a bit, I think, is winning and losing, because the other thing that I imagine if you've heard anybody like me talk as well, 
you will hear is that we all lose a lot. None of us ever wins everything before you win big ones. Yeah, well, I, I saw my three Olympics. I lost my first one. I came fourth. I was devastated. It was horrible. And I won my second one, so I came first in my second Olympics. I mean, before that, even on the sort of uh, on the way through stage, I remember not doing the best time for two years. When I was about four, I think it was about thirteen, fourteen, for about a year and a half. I didn't do the best time. I used to get really quite a bit upset about that. I can be dispirited because you need to train really hard. But what happens is you, you go through different growths. I mean, some of you will have grown recently over the summer. My daughter's shop over the summer. I looked at it and I went, wow, she's got bigger. And you grow at different rates. And that's the interesting thing in sport, the age group sport, is you all grow at different rates. So some kids you might be beating one year might just have a growth spurt and be stronger and bigger than you the next year and you can't beat them. But you might catch up the year after, but you've got to hang in there. It's quite an interesting little story, actually. So when I was 14... Um, I used to come, I was in, I'm, I'm from Yorkshire, so I was in the Yorkshire County Championships, and at 14, my best result was second, so silver medal at Yorkshire Counties, and I remember this kid used to enter everything, and he beat me on everything, and he was, he, I, when I watched him, when I wasn't in the heat, he had such a beautiful stroke and technique, I thought, he was taller than me, and he's, I thought, wow, he's brilliant, I actually looked at him and thought, he's brilliant, I, I'm never going to beat him. I remember saying this to my coach, I got out and I was frustrated, I said, look, I've lost him again, I'm never going to beat him. He said, why don't you outlast him? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, wait till he retires, wait till he quits, because he'll be fed up after a while. And he did. So I, so I just hung in there. He said, because basically when you're 17, if that kid's got fed up and quit, you'll beat him because he won't be in the race. I did, he wasn't in the race. And I won nationals, he wasn't there. Because he quit at 15. So something about working out how to last... If, if you're enjoying it, because there's nothing worse than being beaten a lot, because you want to do well. But I actually think if you can see, what you've got to try and work out, I think the other thing that's quite important as well is, as you come through this journey, the, the, the medals and the results are maybe not the biggest thing. It's hard to say this, but you've got to look beyond the silver medal, the bronze medal, the gold, or whatever, and go, OK, underneath it, and the coaches will tell you this, all, all the little bits that make up my performance, am I getting better at them? I'm actually going to put this. It's something that I, I think, well, I know, because I know a lot of high-performing sports people, and they're motivated. I don't know about you, I'll talk, you can think for yourself, but I, and a lot of high-performers, are motivated by winning, and something called mastery. And we all have this in common. And they're different. But this leads to that. So I knew that, oh yes, I wanted to win the Olympics. I wanted to win the Yorkshire Championships. I wanted to win the British National Age Groups. But what you've got to work out is what it takes to do that. Now, there'll be times, you know, and measurements. I mean, they're obvious, right? But under here, I had things like um, <coughs> strength stuff. I had swimming, obviously. I had nutrition. I had psychology. I had, um, what else would I have in that? Phys physiology. So I knew that these, these buckets of stuff, if I was brilliant and I did as well as I could in those, I was more likely to swim fast and more likely to win. But when you can't win sometimes, and all you can do is to master all this, be brilliant at all this, and that's where you can see improvement, because I can, it happened when I was 15, we, were, we had all sorts of goals and things I was working on down here, and I remember one of the goals in the swimming box, I mean in here, I've got technique, swimming technique, and I've also got like starts and turns, so for all your different sports you'll have different things within your technical discipline, and so if you, if you work on those things and, and you, get, you can show you've got proven, you've got better, it's almost like you win this thing, and you win this thing, and you win this thing. And you might not maybe win one of those things, and you win this. So you don't win that in your race, but you've got three or four mini gold medals down here. This is really important, because these things sometimes are not in your control. In fact, they're not. You know, if some kid grows at a different rate, or something happens up throughout in the build-up to the race, if you can show that you progressed on these things, that's where you hang in there because you're making improvements, so that you win, you win gold medals at this level. Does that make sense to people? 
you've got to know what these things are. You know, so, in, so for instance, let me talk about psychology. So, before a race, I would have a routine after having got ready, warmed up to reporting for the race and getting behind the block and getting onto the block and starting my race. And a lot of that preparation was in the way I coped with it, how I felt, the anxiety I might have, that I was thinking about the thing. So I could, talk, I could rate myself on a 1 to 10 scale how I was coping before a race, you know, 5 or 6 or 10, I'm coping well, 10. And my goal was to have a 10. Yeah. So I could, if I might, I might lose a race, but I am actually rate myself. I'm actually, you know, that all that preparation I had before, I, I managed myself really well. I was using techniques I'd learned. And so you can rate yourself, and you, you and your coach can rate yourself. And I think in team sports, it's quite easy to work together on things you've done well. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out because I think that through age group sport, this thing is not a given, and it's not as much in your control because lots of things happen. And so what you've got to work out is, am I improving sometimes? Well, you, know, you can split times down. Like, even though I wasn't doing the best time for 100 metres breaststroke, I was doing my best time for the first 12 and a half metres. I was doing my best turn, spin around the wall. I was doing my best last phase of the race. I could work out where I was improving. So you've got to find those little things to hang on to. Does that make sense? Well, so just, so cause it, it, it's quite interesting how it goes, I think, sometimes. In terms of athlete ownership and understanding those mastery bits, yep. when, in your experience, and through the people that you've met along the way, um, when does that happen? For, um, about 13, 14. Uh, the, the grasping of it. Yeah. Um, do you keep logbooks? Do you keep diaries, training diaries? Is it critical? You know, you, yeah, I started keeping a training diary about 12. Um, Basically, you keep a, you know, it's not just a coach, because if you, if a coach, coach sets sessions, coach works with your coach is responsible for the whole thing, yeah, of course, but you have to take responsibility with them, you, you have to own some of it, and you start to own it, when you start to realise that you're not being made to do anything, you're actually choosing it, that's the first thing, you're here because you've chosen to do it, but then you work out, okay, <laughs> if I'm going to do this, I might as well get stuck in and understand it. So training there in logbook, I started around 12. Um, you're just jotting down the things I've done, but then part of that is targets and goals and breaking this down. I mean, you guys, if you're interested in this, just do it tomorrow or the weekend. Where's the weekend tomorrow? Do the weekend. Just get a bit of paper and just work out what you think your big buckets are. So if like you to win in your sport or to be really good at your sport, what are the mastery things? You know, you'll have a technical one, you'll have different bits of them. But by the way, the, the swim one for me had, was the biggest one, obviously, and I broke that down to lots of other ones. So nutrition, psychology, physiology, those, that was a big one. But um, swimming I would break down into starts and turns, um, fitness or strength stuff, um, technique stuff. So I'd break my swimming down into different things as well. You just, you just map what you think they are. And then, and this, then you self-assess, you self-analyse, you work out what you're good at and what you're not good at. Um, yeah, I think 13, 14. Because <clears throat> the thing is, at some point, because the other thing I think which is quite interesting that dawned on me when I was about 15, was my coach wasn't going to swim the race for me. It's kind of obvious, right? But ultimately, you've got to swim your own race, or you've got to do your own performance, and the coach is not going to do it for you. So you have to own it yourself. They're, 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 what coaches are enablers and guides, and I could not have done what I did without my coach. I'm a massive believer in the coach-athlete relationship, that you work together on it. Uh, at this age, though, it's just that they've learned more than you have at the moment. And when you get to... I, I retired when I was 28, so I was still swimming to 28. And I had the best relationship with my coach, where we were starting to work together, understanding it. He still knew more than I did. But I was, I was a person living it out, working it through. So quite important. But when you start to be interested, it's actually interesting because I once, he once set me, my coach, um, it's on a breaststroke, 100 meter breaststroke. He once in training, I was 15, he said, right, we're going to do 10, 10 200 fly. So for those non swimmers, this is not an easy, it's not a nice set to do. Rubbish, actually. 10, 200 meters fly, and I'm a 100 meter breaststroker. I said, why? 
He says, just get on with it. Just do it. No, I'm not doing it. I just be arguing with it. He says, you kick me out. He says, go home. I said, go home. I said, I'm not. Just tell me why I'm doing it. He said, do you really want to know? I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, come to my office tomorrow and I'll run you through the physiology of why we're doing that set. That was 15. And then I went, all right. He said, but go home now because you've been arguing with me. So he kicked me out. So I came back the next day and he ran me through why that session and that set was important. I went, okay, I get it now. I'll do it tomorrow. Because I think there's something about if you feel like you're being done to, it's just that's not, not much fun. So I think that when you start owning it and the coach sees that, you can start getting interested and involved. And it makes it a lot more fun, really. Because it's, it's just a different dimension to sport. That is the thinking about it and the planning it and being interested and in not just going to the pool or to the gym or to the pitch because you've been told to or you think you should. What else? Um, and you've got, you got to steer me anywhere else, anybody? Anything on that or anything else you're interested in? Further from that, obviously you said that you know, as part of your growth and, and the that sort of mastered it into winning and sort of the improvements is everything and winning is part of that team, yeah. that sort of idea. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but when you were these guys' age, yes. there wasn't the internet, there wasn't YouTube. Yeah. How did you... That's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm getting, Black and I'm white guessing, TV, mate. Well, <laughs> I'm guessing that... Not all of that stuff will have come to you from school. Not all of that stuff will have come to you from your information gathering. Will have come from your coach. Oh yes, watches. yes. So, did you do any sort of? Were you researching stuff yourself? Were you reading up on these areas? Or? Yeah, there was no internet. You're yeah, dead right. Yeah, yeah. So what happened on this was, no, I would be introduced to people. So it's people. It's, it's face to face. So. I remember when we first got a nutritionist down, and you might not, but you, you guys will not believe this, but we didn't used to rehydrate during training, right? We didn't used to drink water at all. And so I used to get tired out. So I started training on a Sunday, and by Friday, my 10th session, I'd be absolutely knackered on my, on the, on my knees, and I just thought it was because I'd been working hard. And we got a nutritionist to come down, and she weighed me before the training session, and weighed me after the training session. And I'd lost six pounds of weight, whatever that was, in kilograms, no, three, whatever of weight, kilograms, and she said, that is not fat, that is all water, you've lost all that water, you need to drink water in the pool, but we said, what, you drink water, I like couldn't work it out, yeah, so that was the old days, but so, but it was only having her come and talk and give us some information, that's how I got my information, through the, the experts, and listening, but you needed people to make, help you make sense as a kid, because I didn't quite understand some of the things she was saying, but she's really good at trying to translate it through. Um, but the other thing was Terry, my swimming coach, would give me things to read. You know, articles, he'd co photocopy things from swimming magazines, from other magazines, so other sports. And uh, before the training session, he'd give me a couple of sheets of paper, maybe two or three times a week. Once I'd done that challenging him thing, he said, are you really interested? I said, I am interested. And so he said, okay, let's read this. I read it, and I said, he said, if you've got any questions, come and ask me. So he'd make time just before the session. We'd work out when it was good for him and for me, and we'd sit down together. And sometimes there three or four of us that were interested. So we started talking together as swimmers. So the other, that's the other thing, is you have to work it out together. Sometimes it's not 